oil and water type discussions that we've had. And so we get together, but we've made a pact with God that we're going to keep moving forward no matter what happens. We're picking up the pieces and we move ahead. We keep going. We keep going. So we're just going to do a few minutes, each, uh, each church, what they're doing and what's going on. The first person that I want you to hear a little bit about is Isaiah Lopez. Everybody here know who Isaiah is? Probably a lot of people do. Okay. Isaiah has been our Bible worker at Prescott for the last, what, two years, two and a half years? Yeah, about two and a half years, yes. Bible worker before that, whereabouts? Caribou. Okay. How long were you Bible worker at Caribou? Oh, I don't know, four or five years, somewhere around four there. Four or five years. Yes. There you go. Amen. Now, it's, when you go out and do Bible work, I take it you got six years and you probably have had no success yet, but you're still doing it anyway, right? Well, you know, that would be great if I had that type of motivation <laughs> to keep going to, ahead with failure. But no, the Lord has been so gracious to us that uh, we have seen success. The Lord has touched the hearts of many people in our community. Amen. Amen. So have you had some baptisms? As a result yes, of we've study? had some baptisms. Uh, last year we had a few. The year before that, a few. And I think a couple of years before that, we had a few. So I know that uh, uh, the work that has, go has gone on in the last year or two in Presque Isle has been a direct result of most of the ministry that Brother Isaiah has done. He's doing a tremendous job. There's a lot of Bible studies going on. And my wife. And his wife. <laughs> yeah, she, they're, they're a team. Yeah, we're a team. I can't do that alone. Don't go to the door by yourself. It's nerve wracking. So, so would you suggest, Isaiah, yeah. that nobody try to do anything like this? No, I wouldn't suggest that. I suggest that every single one of us do it. Get out of your comfort zone. Talk to your neighbor. Knock on a door. Talk to the person at the gas station. Make friends. Make friends. Talk to somebody about Jesus. So how do you get people interested in the Bible study? Well, you know, John, I, I can talk about a lot of methods. Um, but I want to tell you that. The biggest thing, and I think we all know this, I'm preaching to the to the crowd, right? You got to be praying. You have to be praying because the Lord is the one who's going to do the work. And you just got to show up and make yourself available. And then the Lord is going to make things happen. So, so what do we do? We knock on doors. We do surveys. We just pray with people. We become friendly. If we know somebody in the community that knows somebody that needs something. We try to be there. We try to be a help to whoever we can get in com contact with. So what do you mean you try to be there? I mean, I've seen your car going down the road with three people and I've never seen in my life. <laughs> now, what are you doing? Moving people around somewhere to do something? Sometimes we do that. Okay. Yeah, sometimes we do pe move people around. But no, we, um, we make ourselves available in a sense if somebody needs to go to a grocery store and we're available, we take them to the store. Like on the way here, we, well, before coming, I missed the baptism because three of our contacts had to go home and uh, on the way back, there was a man walking, so I pulled over and asked him if he needed a ride. So make myself available, give him a ride to wherever he needs to go. And then from that, try to make a contact and try to get a Bible study. So one thing that Brother Isaiah tries to do is be all things to all people. Amen. And so everybody needs help, right, at some point <laughs> in their life? Everybody does. And everybody. so if you're there at the right time? Yeah, the Lord, you know, sometimes my wife and I are off-duty. If there's such a thing as an off-duty Christian, and uh, it just happened two weeks ago. We were in front of a, a, a contact's house. My wife was inside visiting the contact, and I was in the, in the car waiting for her. And I was reading Desire of Ages, and this man appeared right where John is at, and he started talking to me. And John, I got to be honest with you. I was going to tell him, "Could you leave me alone?" Because <laughs> I'm human. I got to be honest with you. I was enjoying Desire of Ages. I didn't want to share. Right. So I started talking to him. He started talking to me, and then right before he left. He says something that blew me away. He said, you know, if you invite me to church, I may come. So that sounds amazing, right? But, but you want to hear what's really amazing? Is I didn't tell him I was a Christian. I didn't tell him I was going to church. He said, if you invite me to church, I may come. He didn't know I was a Christian. I didn't tell him. But why is that? Because, for instance, our local church in Caribou, they're meeting together together. Every Thursday at six o'clock in the morning and every, uh, I'm sorry, every Tuesday and Thursday at six o'clock in the morning. And everybody's praying for divine appointments, John. Amen. And the Lord threw what I call a fish in my lap. I was in a fishing boat. I didn't cast my line out and the fish jumped in my lap. I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> That's because people are praying. So remember, prayer and effort, they go together. You can pray till you're blue in the face. Nothing will ever happen. You can go knocking on doors till you're blue in the face. Nothing happens. But when you join the two together, Jesus begins to do something. Amen. 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 Amen.
Thank you, Brother Isaiah. Really appreciate that. Thank you, John. And I appreciate I, it. I can tell you one thing about Brother Isaiah. You don't have to watch him. You don't have to do it. He's out working. I mean, you know, he, he works for the church. You don't have the, the way you tell if he's doing anything, new people show up at church on a regular basis. So, and so this man is on fire, loves the Lord, and he and his wife are doing a great job. Well, th thank you, John. That's really nice to hear that. You know, but it's really Jesus. It's not It's not us. You know, my wife and I will we'll tell you straight on, it's really the Lord. We just show up to work and he does stuff and we appreciate it. And we get the privilege of seeing souls saved and lives changed, you know. Uh, two of our friends today that were here, they're Baptists. And um, when we dropped them off, they told us how much they loved us and how they're growing closer to us. Amen. And we didn't know them from anything. Amen. You know, actually, they're not even our contacts, John. Sister Melissa, one of our members in the Caribou Church, she was in the emergency room and she saw this couple there reading a Bible and she approached them and said, you guys are Christians? And then she gave them a ride at four o'clock in the morning. Amen. And she's not a Bible worker per se. You know, she don't get paid to do that. But she was there and she says, you need to meet my friends, Isaiah and Melissa. And she threw them to me. I mean, Isaiah and Maria. And she threw them to us. And now we have to take care of them. John, thank you. We took more than five minutes. No, you did great. Thank you, Brother Isaiah. Brother Ashley, would you please come up here and, and uh, our partner with you? So, Brother Ashley is part of a team that heads up the church down in Lincoln, and he is a huge part of what's been going on here in this property. And every year he and his wife come up here and they, they help us establish everything. His wife is the registrar and uh, just a, a great team. And they've got a great fellow here that's a team with them down there. Philip Pennington. He's one of our elders. So what do you guys have going on that you're doing down there? What are your plans? Well, we don't have a lot of plans right now for evangelism, but what we have been doing in the past uh, <clears throat> so we don't have any real plans at this present time for evangelism. Um, but what we, what we have done in the past is um, cooking schools. Um, we've done um, house seminars. We've also have a sign out in front of our church, a big uh, four by eight sign where we, we put uh, different Bible texts, different questions, um, sayings and things like that. And people in the community have really, uh, related to that, uh, we've had a number of people comment to me and others um, how they, they like these messages. It, it's kind of inspiring for them. Um, we have to sit down and do some formulating, but we have had one, a number of people coming to our church. And um, like Isaiah said, it's kind of like a fish that lands out of the water and we haven't reeled it in. We had one really neat story. It start, uh, started actually about 10 or 12 years ago. This gentleman by the name of um, Harold, we call him Old Harold. He showed up one Sabbath morning to uh, church. And <clears throat> what was interesting is that uh, unbeknowing to us, he was going to the church next door on Sunday. And so every Sabbath he would come to church. And after about the third Sabbath, I, I mean, we, we befriended him and invited him to lunch like we normally do. And after the second or third time he showed up to church, I asked him if he wanted Bible studies, and he said, sure. So we started having regular Bible studies, and before I knew it, there was another gentleman uh, that was running a uh, veteran program, uh, John Nelson. He decided that he wanted to make sure that uh, Old Harold wasn't being taken in by some cult. And so he inserted himself into the Bible study, and before we knew it, we were having the Bible study down at John's office. He had a real estate business going on along with his work with the veterans. And so before we knew know it, uh, John was studying the prophecies and the, the doctrines and everything with old Harold. And as time went on, Harold passed away. He was pretty, pretty ancient. And, um, and then John went through some problems and he disappeared out of our lives. And I probably two or three years went by and one Sabbath morning, John shows up just out of the blue. And we start studying and working with him, and he joined the church. And later on, he confessed to me, he said, you know, Ashley, I was actually going there to make sure that you weren't taking old Harold down the wrong road. He said, but as I sat and studied with you, I realized that the truth that you were sharing with him came from the Bible. 
and today he's a baptized member in our church. In fact, he was, he was at camp meeting. I was hoping he was going to be here, but he, he took off early. So, Ashley, my understanding is you guys bought a piece of property near your church? Yes, we right did. Next door. Okay, you just, you're going to turn it into a golf course? or? <laughs> Well, when you and uh, Wayne don't work me to death and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying all we can. So, no, uh, we're all busy beepers down there. But we, our plans are to put some sort of a medical missionary facility up. Excellent. Probably not quite that big, but, um, you know, something that the Lord's work can go forward in Good. the area. Good. Does your elder here have something to add? Well, our young people go into college now, and uh, you'd be surprised on – what happens when you act as a peculiar people Amen. and don't blend in? And the young, the young people going to college started having folks ask them questions about their faith. Amen. And enough people started asking questions where we were able to have a Bible study at the college. And there was already a group having Bible studies there, but I you know, was blessed and fortunate enough that they invited us over. And at the end of the, of the last school year, before the coming uh, summer uh, vacation, we were having Bible study with five of the students. Uh, one of the students, uh, I will keep his name, I, I won't say his name just yet, uh, but he was, he's not a Seventh-day Adventist, and he's a Sunday believing Christian, started after the Bible study, we were using Amazing Facts, started to ask his pastor about the Sabbath. And it resonated with me because the Sabbath is the same way I entered into the church. Having a synagogue next to my house, me knowing Jesus was a Jew and he, Jew, the Jews kept the Sabbath, why don't we as Christians keep the Sabbath? And that's how I entered into the, to the faith. This young man was asking the same questions and a, a big Chester Cat smile was coming on my face as he pursued asking his pastor the question. And you know what his pastor said? The Sabbath is correct. I only, we only worship on Sunday because I get paid to. That's a tough call. But the preacher was honest. And because of that honesty, that young man is starting to understand the word of God and the Sabbath. So you keep the young people in, at, at Huston uh, University, uh, Huston College in prayer. You keep those Bible studies in prayer because the devil is attacking and has attacked. But we're, we're, the, God is strong. Amen. God is strong and the truth shall come out. And, you, and we do have non adventists coming that we're working. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it, gentlemen. No problem. Carrie Simpson? So Carrie's a member of the Presque Isle Church, and Carrie's been working on a project. The whole church has been working on a project. So what are you guys doing down there? What's the plans? Well, some of the plans some of our local brothers and sisters don't even know about yet <laughs> because we're told in prophecy that the, the final movements will be rapid ones, won't they? And so a few weeks ago, we had a church meeting um, with, with pastor and a number of the brothers and sisters. And we were burdened that we need to do more to reach out to the community, to our neighbors. And so what could this look like? And brother John had a vision of going into the, into the mall, the Aroostook County mall. And most of you go right by that or close to it on your way out of here, if you're from the South. And and his vision was to rent a storefront. There's a number of vacant storefronts in the mall and to rent a storefront and have this as, you know, a, a, per, a perhaps non-confrontational meeting site where people could be invited to have uh, seminars, health seminars, Bible studies, etc. And the amazing thing about this storefront, it's vacant right at the end of the food court. Well, so after the meeting, we voted as a church um, to, to allocate enough funding to rent this for that purpose. Now, that was probably, if you had 10 people, would you have six vote yes, four vote no? Well, I'm pretty sure it's unanimous. It was a unanimous vote, wasn't it? It's called unity, brothers and sisters. And if God is asking us to do it, there's no reason we can't agree on doing it. And everybody agreed that they would take a part. And actually physically going down, didn't they? That's the painful part. Right? <laughs> Brother John uh, asked each one of us if we would commit to a period of time. And I think mine was uh, 10 minutes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we already know he's uh, pre-committed uh, at least 10 hours a week. So. Yeah. 
So after the meeting, a few of us got together and we were invited to come down and view this, this place in the mall. And while we were there, we were, we were talking about what we could, how we could use it, how we could most um, adequately use it. And as we were there, we noticed that there was a storefront right next to it that was also vacant. And as we started walking around in that one, it's, it was a much larger space and it had a storefront already designed. It, it, the vision started to come to us together. And what if, what if we were to open a health food store right here next door? And three minutes later, what if that health food store uh, incorporated a bakery? And what if we added bulk foods? and natural foods, and perhaps... Uh, Hopefully maple syrup or something that's <laughs> sweet, right? And, and maybe some maple syrup, too. And so hence the, hence the name, maple, maple Bucket and Bakery. And so, brothers and sisters, all of this evolved within an hour as God blessed, the Holy Spirit was with us, and we started to develop a vision. Within a couple of weeks, and that's the reason we haven't had a meeting again as, as a fellowship, um, a number of things happened. We talked to the mall owner. We shared our vision. He's very excited about what, what we want to do and what, what it could do for his mall and bringing people in. So where we're at today, brothers and sisters, we're late in history. And if we don't do it now, we may not be able to do it. Now, God may not be calling all of you to open a bakery. It's a big undertaking or a natural food store. But don't be surprised if he asks you to do something larger than you think you have the capability of doing. It's late and we serve a big God. So now we currently have planned tentative plans. We're still in the negotiating stage for the two spaces, but they're on hold. And one of my family members who is not a church member heard about the vision and said, I'll rent that the entire winter so that it's available for you in the spring. Brothers and sisters, this will happen. Next year on your way to camp meeting, stop by the Maple Bucket and Bakery. And in the meantime, we are, we are planning on a spring opening. And of course, we're asking for your prayers. Um, it takes key people, talented people, to be able to, 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 to make this happen. We don't know who those people are right now. So keep that in your prayers. And we look forward to the next thing that God asks us to do and yourselves. Thank you, Brother Kerry. Appreciate that. Brother Wayne, Brother Wayne Smith, he is heading up the Church of Caribou, Maine. And the Church of Caribou, Maine has always been a moving church. And it doesn't sit very long and something else is happening. So, Brother Wayne, what's happening at the Caribou Church? What well, plans? Um, John, you were a member of the Caribou Church. You know. Absolutely. So... John moves things. He's a, well, you didn't know no. he was in the moving business. But uh, John can really get things going. And uh, he has a lot of drive and energy. And he brought that to the Caribou Church. And we have been moving ever since, actually before then. Because Caribou Church, can you believe it? Can you believe it? It's a church plant that was planted around 2011 uh, after an evangelistic series. And uh, it was a real blessing. And uh, we've been uh, growing we, uh, we now are about 60 members, and uh, we have a lot of different outreach uh, things that we do. We are um, having an evangelistic program every year. Uh, we have uh, health evangelism as well. And next month, we're having David DeRose coming, uh, September 13th through 15th. Um, also, we're part of the, this, we're the closest church to here, so we have a lot of our members uh, come out here and work and uh, take care of things and try to make things better. We also have uh, ministries at church, not evangelistic per se, but every week we have a weekly potluck. You know, potlucks are very important for members to get acquainted. That's part of the growth experience is getting to know people. So getting to know people, it works best when you share a meal. And uh, we share meals every Sabbath. But we also share a meal every Friday night. We have a Friday night Bible study, right, Isaiah? Yeah. And uh, you enjoy it? Amen. Yeah, we have uh, good food and good studies. We're studying right now uh, the Great Controversy Study Guide. We have anywhere from 30 
uh, 20 to 30, sometimes up to 35 people coming. And it's a good study. People get together, they meet together and eat together. When you eat with somebody, it really breaks down the barriers. And have you enjoyed meeting uh, other people and eating with them? That's one of the blessings of having a sit-down meal. And I'm just so thankful to Maria for providing that for us. Um, how many of you are aware of our YouTube channel? You know about our YouTube channel? Has anybody, everybody been to our YouTube channel? Um, did you know that uh, we have 3,500 people that are subscribers to our YouTube channel? Guess how many hours were watched last month? Over 3,300 hours. 3,300 hours were watched last month. Now, you ask me, what is the number one video of all of our videos that we have on the, our YouTube channel? Pavel Goya. Hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, from our camp meeting here. Hmm. Guess how many hits? 63,000 hits wow. on that one. So if you ever want to tell somebody you want to watch the best sermon you've ever seen, go to our YouTube channel and look up spiritual warfare. It's powerful. I look at it about once a year just to get re-inspired. So look it up, Spiritual Warfare by Pavel Goya. If you do a Google search, it'll probably direct you right to our church uh, website. Um, the other thing about our, our church website, um, number three, guess who number three is? Our own Conrad Vine, number three. You know what the title is? Title is... Secrets of Sabbath Rest. You want to know the secrets of Sabbath Rest? Go to the website. Look it up. Anyway, so we're, we're busy doing different things. Um, everybody, we try to involve everyone. Our elders do the evangelism. Uh, we also had Elder Blanchard doing uh, an evangelistic series last November. It was a blessing. And so I encourage you to step forward in faith. Um, going forward with evangelism, even if uh, you're not all in agreement in the church, when you have evangelism, it kind of brings your church together. Even if you don't bring anybody in, it's a good reminder of what you believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother John. Well, thank you, Brother Wayne. I'd like to say I paid Brother Wayne $10 to say good things about me, but that'd mean he sold himself out too cheap. So I uh, want to invite David Barrett up here. I, I had a, a mind-deadening situation. forgot about Brother David. Brother David is doing the work up in the Madawaska area. His brother... Hey, right over here. <laughs> Why are you shaking his head? No, no, I didn't pay you ten dollars to say good things about me today. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> Brother David. This is Isaiah's calling, wasn't it? Hey, I got people everywhere. I got agents everywhere. <laughs> uh, Brother David, I heard you're doing some wonderful things up there in Madawaska. You're up there, kind of all alone from time to time. And uh, what do you have going on? Oh boy, where do you even begin? Um, yeah, we opened up the church by God's grace. Uh, Pastor Arnett and his wife uh, invited me up to come up there when they found out uh, I was living in Van Buren. And um, the church has been closed for about three years or plus. And so when they first asked if I would reopen the doors and get things started, I was like, no, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to. I, Wanted to stay far away from that. But seeing the church doors close right in the middle of Main Street, Madawaska, it really rubbed me the wrong way and have God's church closed. So by the grace of God, we did an undertaking to reopen the doors. And we've been there now for one year uh, plus and um, seeing God's hand providentially, uh, providentially at work. Uh, it's been a wonderful thing. We are doing evangelism September 26th. Uh, at the Madawaska High School Library. And so we're inviting everybody from Van Buren to Fort Kent and everybody in between. So if you live in up that neck of the woods, you will be getting a, an invitation to come out to the meetings. So uh, we're praying that, you know, the Lord Jesus is going to move up there. Amen. So, yeah. It's, How many uh, meetings, Brother David? Oh, we're going to do a full-fledged uh, campaign. Um, you know, we'll be up to school for about a week and a half during harvest break, and then we'll transition over to the church. So now when you do that, you're just going to have a series of meetings. If you baptize somebody, you baptize them, that's it, right? And then you sit back and watch. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a lot involved. In, oh, is there more involved? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of nurturing as well. As a matter of fact, if you saw one of the baptisms today, our sister Patricia. Patricia, are you here? Oh, she left. 
She left. Ah, a sister and her husband. She's part of that group. Praise the Lord, Patricia and her husband, Irvin. Yeah, so they were there years ago. And then when we decided to reopen the church, we visited the folks that were fellowshipping up there. And when we mentioned, when we stopped by uh, Patricia and Irvin's place. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah, they, they were there that following Sabbath and been ever since. So in your opinion, Brother David, is this just a select few that are able to do anything with soul no, winning? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm living proof. Uh, you, you, if you're willing, you, you answer the prayer. Here I am, Lord, send me. He will send you. There's no question. Uh, absolutely. He's just looking for willing people to do the work. That's all it is. It's all that matters. Amen. Amen. Uh, Thank you, Brother David. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the work you're doing. One thing I just highly recommend for anybody that thinks they've never, they could never give Bible studies, we have such a blessing with our rich history of Seventh-day Adventists. One thing that I highly recommend people that I'm trying to educate on how to give a Bible study is I hand out uh, little booklets called Haskell's Bible Handbook. And in there is many, many hundreds, several hundred, I believe, Bible studies. You can mark your Bible. Anybody can give a Bible study. Just read it three or four times, and you'll get the hang of it. Trust me. When you do it, the Lord will open doors for you. He'll give you strength. If you make a mistake, it's not a problem. Everybody makes mistakes. I make more than anybody. So if I can do it, I know anybody else can. So that gives you a little overview. I believe everybody can go out, give a Bible study, can win a soul to the Lord, can just you know help somebody right where they're at. And the methods of Christ alone will bring true success. So thank you for listening. We're going to go right into our question and answer period. And so stay tuned. This is for you. So if you haven't already turned in, to, turned in a card, <clears throat> we have so many here to go through that I doubt we're going to get to any more new ones. Not to discourage anybody, but just kind of for information. Thank you so much. Okay. 
that you were thinking about being a bunch of movies. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Ooh. I knew that. This is going to be fun. You want something like a book or something to go on? Maybe a couple pieces of little rock. <laughs> That should be enough. Any chance we can move this table oh, okay. Thanks. over just a little bit because Conrad that pole right in the way. We sure can. Just a little bit. Is this, is this one for me? Yes. Yeah. If that will work. <laughs> so we're ready. And uh, I'm going to ask David Gates if you would have opening prayer for us. Thank you. So we bow our heads, please. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are here in your presence at this time. We realize that we're living in solemn times, and we ask you to direct our minds, our words, our thoughts, that they may be from heaven, that they may be true, and that, we may, that it may draw us closer to you. We realize there's a lot of important questions and we may not have all the answers, but you do. Mm -hmm. And so we ask that your word may guide us today. And we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start out with a fairly easy one here today. Um, why do you think there are so many more people baptized in foreign countries than here in the U.S.? Um, David, you seem to travel quite a bit, You, both you and Conrad, so maybe the two of you can take a hard look at that question. I, I've discovered that, that hard times make for more interest in spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And the harder times get, the more people are interested in help from God. And so the third world country has a lot of hard times. Uh, people are suffering. And there's great masses of people that need God's help. So when you offer them um, an answer to their, diffi their difficult needs and their pain, uh, we find that there's a great interest. For example, just handing out literature. <laughs> I was handing out on the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther. We were, in, we were in Denmark handing out literature. They're officially Lutheran. Everybody was saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. Are you Lutheran? Yes. This is about Luther. No, thank you. But when we go to some other countries, we can take 100,000 pieces of literature and they're gone just like that. In Lima, Peru, we printed great controversies and we were just taking the boxes home and people saw the boxes and they were reaching through the bus windows. We, we gave away 1,000 copies of Great Controversy before we even reached home. And the people in the bus, and a bus driver stopped the bus and said, I want one too. <laughs> so, so there's a great interest in areas. And the wonderful thing, the good news for North America is hard times are coming. <laughs> right, would you like to... Yeah, I would add to what uh, Pastor David has said, and I would say that um, in the West we have affluence, and affluence blinds our eyes to the spiritual struggles going on around us. It insulates us from the realities of good and evil to a, to a great extent. And when you're living in, in relative poverty, you see the reality of evil, not just of poverty. Uh, people who live in, in, say, the developing world, they are acutely aware of the problem of evil spirits and of curses and of spells and of magic. And they understand that there is evil. And so when Jesus is presented as the one who has authority to set you free from spirits, they are very, very interested in learning about Jesus. And so I think that um, 
paradoxically in the West, our, our wealth is a blessing from God, but it is also a two-edged sword. And the wealthier we get, the less we sense our need of God. And the, the more blind we are to the realities of the spiritual battles going on inside of our lives. And so sometimes I think God allows us to go through hard times as a nation in order for us to realize our need of God once again. Amen. Can I just add something? Add something really simple. Um, when this COVID crisis hit, I found it super easy to pick up Bible studies. And so it's just like my two brethren here have just said, when things get bad, things people start reaching out. Mm -hmm. And so things are going to get really bad again soon. And just be ready. Amen. There's a um, there's a condition that we're all familiar with in the book of Revelation. And it's a spiritual condition talking about Laodicea. And that's a horrible condition. But it's also true in a literal sense as well. Rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. Recognizing your need is the most important factor to receive the gospel in Jesus as a personal savior. And that's one of the reasons why the revival of primitive godliness that's coming will only happen in this nation when we see economic collapse, hard times. We're going to see the pestilences in diverse places. And then will the affluent nations actually start to recognize their need for God, which is very important for us at that time to be giving a loud cry that they be not swept away by the counterfeit solution to that problem. Next question. Please give... Specific, right please give specific. Um, can you hold the mic closer? Try to read this right in here. Regarding, regarding okay. the actions, please give specific um, regarding our actions during the beginning of the National Sunday Law. Are we or are we not to go to church on Sunday uh, in addition to Sabbath? I've heard conflicting response to this issue. Okay. Well, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Amen. And that's where I stand on this. Now, anybody in this room can go to church on Sunday to appease the powers that be, but I don't believe in bowing the knee to bail one bit, and I don't believe in pretending to tie my shoe. Now, you might call me radical for that and say that I'd be bring, uh, you know, undue persecution ahead of time, but that's where I stand. I don't want to even give the semblance that I'm going along with this new world order. That beast power is coming. God will have a people who stand though the heavens fall and call sin by its right name. So that's where I stand. Amen. I want to just add to what my brother just said. Um, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that when this time comes, we are to give no evidence, no evidence that Sunday is a holy day. <clears throat> So we are not to be showing that we're going to church and keeping that day holy. She talks about having tent meetings, going door to door, Bible studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the doors being open on a seventh day keeping church on the Sabbath is a stern rebuke to people that are not keeping that day holy. Yeah, the commandment isn't just about remembering the Sabbath day. It says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work." Amen. And so I'm not sure the Western weekend is entirely biblical. Um, we have six days to labor and do our work and one day to worship God. And so for that reason, um, to give the appearance of worship on a day set aside for work, um, it seems to be going against the commandment. David, do you have a thought? Yeah. We can get an idea how this can be a little bit difficult to resolve in many minds. Uh, I was in Samoa a few years ago, and there's the U.S. Samoan Islands, and then there's the country of Samoa. And, and they had just recently redirected the international date line before all the Samoans were on the same day. But now they split them in half, and so just 30 miles away was Friday, and over here was Saturday. And, and then we had a problem. Do we worship with our brethren that are just 30 miles away on their Sabbath? Or, or do we keep Sunday? And, and it's half of the church said, let's just keep doing it the same day with our brethren. So they were going to church with all the Catholics and the evangelicals. And the other half said, no, we're going to do it on the day that our country says. If today's Saturday, then we'll do it on Saturday, not on Sunday. And so the church had to wrestle with this. And it caused 
some difficulties, but eventually I understand they finally came to an agreement, but you can see that not everybody can see it the same way right away. So when that issue comes, do we, do we open the door? Do we not go? Uh, in New Orleans, there was one church, I don't know which one, where the pastor said, let us, let us uh, go out and do Bible work on Sunday, on Sabbath, and we'll keep the church closed. And on Sunday, we all come to church and we talk about our wonderful experiences we had on Sabbath. But that's really the opposite. That's like going to church on Sunday and keeping the door closed on Saturday. So uh, there's going to be individual decisions on either side. And you have to decide, are you going to stand where you're going to stand? And may God show us clearly how to deal with that issue when it comes. Because we don't know exactly the format it's going to take. But that, that is the decision we have to make. Let us not forget that we live in a republic that's designed to protect the natural and alien rights of the individual. And this issue will be an issue over liberty of conscience. Obviously, it's an issue over who the authority is in your life and worshiping the creator and spirit and truth. But remember the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That word religion was defined in the first Congress as John uh, James Madison's definition that he gave in 1776, which is the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of the duty which we owe to our creator or the manner of discharging it, nor prohibit the free exercise of the duty which we owe to our creator in the manner of discharging it. And so somebody should be protesting and not going along with that violation of the First Amendment. I have a hard time believing that Protestants will lay down and go to church on Sunday when we know what we know in prophecy. Just a quick comment. You know, back in the time of the uh, Paul and the early Christians, all they had to do is put a pinch of incense on the Roman altar. Save their life. And that was it. So many would refuse mm. to do that because that's emperor worship. And they gave their life up on mm. that. Next question. Is there a sign to know? Hey, hey, hey. I miss somebody? Can you guys respond to this? Because I think this might be where people get that question. All right. Yes. Okay. So um, when I was in the Middle East, in Dubai, the weekend was Thursday, Friday. And the Sheikh of Dubai realized that if his money exchanges were closed on Thursday and Friday, and New York and Stock and New, uh, London were closed on Sabbath and Sunday, he only had three days a week to trade and do business. So they changed the weekend overnight without any prior consultation from Thursday, Friday to Friday, Sabbath, which allowed um, the markets to stay open on the Thursdays in Dubai. And now they've shifted to um, Sabbath Sunday. So they can have five trading days with the West. And they're allowing their, their Muslim workers two hours off for Friday prayers if they so desire. But the whole weekend has shifted in, in, in Dubai along commercial grounds. And it just shows how society, even Muslims um, who want their Friday prayers, it shows how easily societies shift their weekends in order to maximize economic compatibility. And uh, so when, they, when they've shifted from Thursday, Friday to Friday, Sabbath and Sabbath, Sunday, it, it reminds us that the, you know, the Sunday, final Sunday laws with economic compulsion sanctions um, will be, most people will just fall in line with it. There's a paper on the back table there. There's four different papers that are four or five pages long. One of those deals with this subject and it was written in 1889 by a lady by the name of Ellen White. And she's commenting on some things. A fellow by the name of A.T. Jones had gone down to the, uh, the Senate and explained the position that we as Adventists believe. And it's a comment on how he's treated what we should do during that time. You might find that interesting. Are we going to comment on this quote? Okay. That's it. We're going to comment on this quote here. You <clears throat> can if you want. I haven't seen the quote. Have you read it? All right, so Sister White says, in Testaments for the Church, Volume 9, page 9233. Uh, um, she says, Sunday can be used for carrying forward various lines of work that will accomplish much for the Lord. On this day, open air meetings and open cottage meetings can be held. House to house work can be done. Those who write can devote this day to writing their articles. Whenever it is possible, let religious services be held on Sunday. Make those services intensely interesting. 
sing genuine revival hymns, and speak with power and assurance of the Savior's love. Speak on temperance and on true religious experiences. And so um, the question is, uh, how, what's our comment on this? Well, this is a paragraph um, that's taken from um, Testimonies, uh, Volume 9, and it comes um, after another paragraph which does speak about does speak about the Sunday laws. The immediately preceding paragraph um, talks about, let me just share it here, when we devote Sunday to missionary work, the whip, the whip will be taken out of the hands of the arbitrary zealots who will be well pleased to humiliate Seventh-day Adventists. When they see that we employ ourselves on Sunday in visiting the people and opening the scriptures to them, they'll know it is useless for them to try to hinder our work by making Sunday laws. And so she's talking here about not when Sunday laws are imposed, but what we should be doing before Sunday laws. And in that sense, I would say, in, uh, as you said, missionary work, going door to door, visiting the sick. Um, but it is a shame that our churches are only generally open on Sabbath mornings and maybe Wednesday nights. And many people would like to, when they walk by a, a church, particularly say in a city and it's lunchtime, there are people who just want a quiet place to go and sit and pray. Catholic churches, for example. Yes, yes. yes. And I think uh, she's talking here about before Sunday laws come into effect, not, one, not when Sunday laws are in effect. And she's essentially saying that our churches really should be open every day of the week for people to come and experience God's presence. Amen. You know, when we do foreign mission work, um, one of the things that you notice right away is that the Seventh-day Adventist churches are generally meeting four or five days a week, depending where you're at. And that's a radical thing, you know, to consider in the United States of America. But the churches are open and the saints are coming together four or five days a week to press together. And uh, I believe that if we were to experience that here, we could experience a, a beautiful revival and also uh, have our churches become a more healthy and safe place that the world now can be, uh, you know, coming right through the doors. And so we may consider that as one. Well. Uh, can I just add a practical note to that? You know, if, if I were a pastor in a district church and we wanted to keep our church open, you know, Monday through Friday or Sunday through Friday, um, I would think long and hard about that because if I were the only person in that church and somebody comes in, an accusation can be made. And so you really need about four people to be there any one time from the Adventist community to guard to protect the reputations of everybody who is there. It's not just that you open the doors and you sit around as the pastor. You have men of violence coming in, you have needy individuals coming in, you have people coming in to try and take you down. And all of this requires, if we are to do it, it requires a substantial number of people there all through the day to protect the reputations of those involved in that ministry and also to protect the reputations of those who may come through the doors as well. Are we ready? In light of the issue of church governance brought to light around the COVID issue, how can we, in light of the issues of church governance brought to light around the COVID issue, how can we move forward to answer the prayer of Christ that we be one in him? Well, I think my brother, brother he would love to answer that. <laughs> um, I think that um, the only way forward is for there to be dialogue. And the only way forward involving dialogue is where church leaders are willing to meet with church members and to hear their legitimate concerns and to recognize what has happened in the past is not what anybody would really want for and for us to find reconciliation and mutual forgiveness. We want to work in unity together, but if no discussion is ever possible about the decisions of our church leaders, we do have a problem. And so um, I've always called for discussions. There have been back channel opportunities to have discussions. They've never taken off. And a lot of things happen behind the scenes, but so far those discussions have simply, nobody wants to respond to them. So I think that there has to be conversation. You can't resolve a conflict if one side is refusing to discuss the conflict. And so we have to um, keep praying and lobbying and asking and uh, writing to people in private and calling them in private and taking every opportunity we can to say that this, this issue needs to be resolved in a way that the church can move forward in a united way. 
I'd like to just comment for a minute. <clears throat> um, giving complete freedom can be an awful chance for, in the world, okay? Um, when you allow somebody to take a microphone and speak, you don't know what he's going to say. But put yourself in that position. If you had to defend your faith, would you want somebody to censor what you're saying? Or would you want it to go direct to the people? One of the things that we have struggled with is being open one with another when there are issues. It's easy to talk behind people's back. It's easy to go to somebody we know that's going to agree with us and to stack the deck, per se. But it's not always easy to just man up or woman up and go say, listen, I've got a problem. I'm, this is what I'm seeing, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we have enjoyed freedom in this nation, the liberty of conscience that we have. We have enjoyed the freedom of speech. And when I watch that get cut off in the churches, that you cannot talk about this in the church. Here people are making decisions that affect their lives, one of the greatest decisions in their lifetime. And we can't discuss it in the church setting. I believe this is wrong. And I believe that we have to become so in tune with one another that we appreciate one another, that we're coming to not tear each other down, that we're coming to encourage. Because if we can't live together here and work our differences out, it's not going to happen in New Jerusalem. This is not an epiphany that takes place on the way to the New Jerusalem, the holy city. This is something that we work on right here. And if it can begin with me, I pray it begins with me and you. And that if, during this next crisis, it's going to be much better if we come together and discuss and work these things out and pray and say, what does God want us to do? It doesn't matter what man says. What matters is what God says. I think that what we're dealing with has um, multiple facets that we should consider. And I think that we may easily fall into the trap of seeking to suppress a symptom rather than addressing the cause. And one of the, one of the issues that we're having the testimonies tell us that the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. When we as a people are confronted with one of life's problems, we would do, be, we would do well first off to be unified on the gospel, that we might simplify it in the right way. Because if we are not unified in the gospel, we really have no unity at all. And so that's one issue that I believe is at the heart of the confusion on some of these things. Christ does not coerce anyone. And the gospel is built on his character. Also, we can have a shallow view of liberty. It's very sad to have the remnant people of God have a shallow view on liberty. We are the ones that have been given truth and religious liberty as a banner to uphold in the last days. And so I believe that we are in desperate need at this time to educate, educate, educate. That's where I see the actual answer being. However, when individuals' natural and unalienable rights are violated, when we start operating like a hierarchical system rather than a priesthood of believers, there will be men who rise up to protest. Praise the Lord for that. We are not part of a country club. We are God's remnant people, and we are Protestants. The devil would love to take the protest out of Protestantism today. I'd like to read you um, a quote from Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 362, about this. It's entitled, Remove the Dictator. The spirit of domination is extending to the presidents of our conferences. If a man is sanguine in his own powers and seeks to exercise dominion over his brethren, feeling that he is invested with, the, with authority to make his will the ruling power, the best and only safe course is to remove him, lest great harm be done and he lose his own soul and imperil the souls of others. All ye are brethren. This disposition to lord it over God's heritage will cause a reaction unless these men change their course. Those in authority should manifest the spirit of Christ. They should deal as he would deal with every case that requires attention. And so here we are at this time in Earth's history. Thank you, brother. And 
this very issue of liberty of conscience is being agitated within the remnant movement. Friends, I'm not surprised it's being agitated in the world. We're told that in prophecy. However, it is very disturbing to me that people who are in leadership positions feel that they can violate the conscience of other individuals and that somehow they are the magistrates or tribunal to determine whether or not it is a conscience issue for the individual. By the way, E.J. Wagner said regarding forced vaccination that the Inquisition was built upon that very premise. So we want to move forward very carefully as God's people regarding this matter. And I believe that God wants us to wake up right now while we have time, press together in unity, because the next test that's coming is going to make this last one look like it is going to be tremendous compared to what we just went through. And so everybody, regardless of what side we were on, has something to learn. Brethren, if you think that you are on the right side of the issue relating to liberty of conscience, make sure the unfeigned love of the brethren, even if they're clobbering you over the head, is the necessity for victory over sin and to receive the seal of God. And brothers and sisters, if you think that this is not a conscience issue, I'm here to tell you that you do not have the authority to force anything into anybody else's body. That is not a Protestant position. Well, we know in the teachings of Jesus that in the parable of the wheat and the tares, that there will be wheat and tares in the visible kingdom of God until Jesus comes again. We also know that there will be a ripening of the harvest. We find that in the parable of the wheat and the tares. We also find it in Revelation chapter 19 and 14. And so God is looking for a harvest of righteousness among his true disciples. We also recognize that there are going to be tares in the body of Christ. And we are just going to have to get used to living with that division until Jesus comes. And that division is going to get worse and worse. There will be a harvest of wickedness among the tares and in the world, as well as a harvest of righteousness among the saints of God. And so I've come to the conclusion that much as I would like everybody to think the way I do, but that's never going to happen, right? I have to give time and space for other people to grow as they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. I have to respect that. And I recognize that within the body of Christ, there are going to be wheat and there are going to be tares. And my responsibility is to ask God to bring a, a harvest of wheat in my life, mm -hmm. that I am ready to, to be a, a ready for the harvest, but also that I can be a, bring the bread of life to those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. So I don't think we're ever going to have unity. I think the worldviews in our church are fundamentally incompatible right now, as we have in the American political system. And so I'm not so concerned about unity per se, because until you all, we all have a biblical worldview and we, we humble ourselves at the foot of the cross and strip ourselves of the earthly ideologies that are driving the show in the church right now, we're never going to find that kind of unity. Not all of us have had the privilege of being raised in the United States all our life. And I... I was raised overseas, educated here, and spent the last 45 years working overseas. And I have to admit that I really am proud when I hear them think we have rights. But I wasn't raised in countries that have these rights. I don't live in a country that has those rights. And when I come up here, and I know a lot of us come from overseas also, but I grew up in Catholic countries. And there was persecution. Even in my lifetime, there's been, there's been persecution. Uh, one pastor I know was in Colombia. And when he was a child, I met, I, after I was hijacked in Mexico and, and was in prison for a period of time uh, on those charges, and then the charges were dropped, but I still met an American in prison, and I knew his dad. He was a secretary of the South American Division. And... When he was raised a child in Colombia, several pastors were chopped up in pieces with machetes uh, by, by the local Catholic priest that gave away alcohol to people and they went after the, the pastor of the church and he escaped with, he had scars all over his legs where he dragged his father and he was able to escape. But the other pastor that could not escape, they chopped him in little pieces and left his parts in a gunny sack and said, this is what we do to Adam and his pastors. Others were drowned in Argentina. Uh, 
with sticks in the water until the body just floated there. They didn't allow anybody to remove the body. So I grew up in countries where there was where there was uh, Inquisition, where the Inquisition was there. You could go in and see all the torture instruments. Uh, I gave many tours to to general conference men who came down when I was working in the Union in Peru and then in Medellin, Colombia, they had the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, so I, I, I see the way Catholicism works and whenever they have a chance, they force their will. But the church who has been Catholic and becomes Adventist reflect the authority the Pope has spoken, so shall it be. So the pastor says something, that's the way it is. You don't, you don't argue. That's just a Catholic mindset. But I'm seeing that mindset of Catholicism creep in all over the world and in North America now, where too much authority is placed in the hands of one person. And obedience is expected. But the pastors are in that same position. Let me tell you, it's not just, it's not just us members. The pastors are in that position. Even presidents are in that position. They have a president above them. And that president's expected to obey the president, which is expected to obey the... So there's an attitude of obey without question. Cre that attitude is creeping in. And I'm just looking at it from an, a foreign point of view of what's happening to our church around. It's becoming more and more rigid in authority, li lines of authority. And that's what we talked. they talked about last night. So it's just from that point of view, uh, we're coming up to the end times. And that issue will affect every single person. Who are you gonna be responsible to? A person or to God? One of the things relating to um, having the, the two sides that you described, Pastor Vine, that we are seeing shaping up, uh, it's very clear, uh, within the body. I think that it would be helpful for each of us because certainly we are identifying with the side here. This, is, this seems to be apparent everywhere we go. That for everybody on every side to understand that there's a very important reality that not one person wants to miss. And that's that over the past five years, not one of us has done everything perfectly. Amen to that. None of us can say that we've done everything perfectly, even if we're totally convinced we're on the right side of the issue. And because we haven't done everything perfectly, if we are going to be honest at all, it necessitates that we offer our brethren on the other side of the issue some grace. Now, that does not mean that we excuse abuse. We do not excuse abuse. But I want to clue you into a grave reality. The Word of God shows us that your natural and unalienable rights will be removed and they will be violated. That's coming. So one of the things that you are called to do as Christ's ambassador, as a remnant Christian, is not only to seek to uphold civil and religious liberty as we're called to do, but even above that, we are seek to uphold God's rights. And God has a right to be glorified in you no matter how you're being challenged. He has a right for his character to be revealed in each one of us no matter how we're being challenged relating to our personal rights. So we want to seek to glorify God in how we process things. We want to seek to glorify God in how we protest even as we move forward. Because the argument that's going to make the, the greatest impact will be the argument that is done in a blameless way that glorifies God. Okay. I think we have gone over that question. <laughs> How do you get your teenagers and young adults to know Jesus? And I'm going to make a comment on this because one of the things that my parents did in our home is we had family worship morning and evening. And even though some of us, as we got older, strayed, those lessons that were poured into our little hearts as children yeah. never left. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, in our family, we um, we have uh, we don't have morning worship because we go to work at different times. We have our separate morning worships as individuals. Uh, we meet every night at nine o'clock as a family. We read our devotionals, we pray together, and we discuss how the day has gone. And that's a chance for us to kind of debrief as a family. That's a chance for me to talk, particularly about how 
God has blessed us in the past as a family and to show the lessons from the past within our own family life. That's one thing. So um, having regular family worships is really important. Uh, secondly, you know, I've got a son down at Southern and I call him every day for a prayer and read a, a passage of scripture with him. And that's a really important part of my day and of his day because I know he's busy, but we know we have that father-son time to talk about things. And um, the, the, the reality about that is that our young people these days are asking questions that we never had at their age. They're asking questions about gender identity. They're asking pretty existential questions at an early age. We used to talk about a midlife crisis. Our teens are going through the midlife crisis in their teenage years now because they're sensing the futility, the philosophy of despair in the schools is filtering through to them. And so uh, I think we as parents need to recognize that our teenagers, they are having profound questions. They're not trying to be difficult. And we need to um, try and educate ourselves in scripture so we can give biblical responses to them and also share our personal testimony. But at the end of the day, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And whatever the decisions that your teens make, I would encourage you just to love them unconditionally. Because in my experience with teenagers in our family, we had really two really good, nice teenagers, but they had a few moments. But we always trusted the Lord that whatever they did today, that he would bring them back into the port. Whatever high seas they sent out to sail on, he'd bring them back into port. And that is what God has consistently done. And so there are times where you just have to say, like when my wife, we say, kneel down, pray, Lord, my son and my daughter in this moment, he or she is in your hands. Just watch over them and uh, we'll see them tomorrow or next week and so forth. And you, learn, you have to learn to trust God and that his spirit is going to work on their hearts. I'd like to just comment for a minute on that. I, I am blessed uh, for those that know me. I have a wonderful wife and uh, two wonderful kids. And I'm probably the happiest married guy you guys have ever met. But I married up. My wife married down. I'm not a complete fool. I did it in front of a lot of people. Got a signed <laughs> contract, witnesses, etc. And so it helps if you have a lot of help from your spouse. And if you try to be on the same page right. as you're doing things. Communication is a huge key. I've not always been the greatest communicator. I mean, I can communicate really well one way. But the other part is to listen. And my wife accuses me sometimes of being deaf even when I'm not, but I'm actually deaf. And so what we did in our family is I agree with my brother here about the family worship. That was always very important that uh, we had. And the other thing is um, we went everywhere. We had our kids with us. We homeschooled. Uh, we toured across the country, went across Canada. We tried to do a lot of things with our kids, and we still do. It was, we had this uh, kind of thing that I would say is we're all, we're all in this together. It's all for one and one for all. So if one's hurting, everybody's hurting. And we still feel that way. So when the COVID thing hit, the first people we wanted to talk to, we had a family meeting. My kids are grown up, adults. And the, uh, the feedback that we got from our two children, my wife and I, was tremendous. We're speaking to two adults that are far smarter than the parents are. And that was wonderful. And so a lot of times, you know, as the children get older, we treat them still like a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old. And they are adults. Young people are very intelligent. And if we give them the opportunity, uh, teach them to read and teach them to communicate. That's a very big thing, and that family is very important. Well, I had, we had the privilege of having two daughters biologically, and we adopted three, a little Mexican and, and two Peruvians. Uh, so we have three daughters and two sons, and we have a wonderful family. I only regret that I didn't adopt five more. <laughs> We, we just love our family together, but not everybody's chosen to be missionaries. Two daughters are missionaries. The other three have chosen at this point not to be missionaries. We encourage them. We pray for them. There are spiritual problems with, with uh, them sometimes, uh, but all of us have times of spiritual problems. And, and 
Prayer is the biggest thing. We just have complete confidence that God is in control. And we love them and we love them. And like, like uh, Pastor Vine said, love your children. In, include them unconditional love. Whether, whether they dress like you do, whether they don't dress like you do, whether they cut their hair, don't cut their hair. You know what? We just love you to death. Not embarrassed. You can come up with me anytime, anywhere. This is my son. You know, and, and uh, uh, we're grateful that God is in charge. And we sleep well at night because we turn them over into the hands of our Savior. And he knows what to do with them while we're sleeping. And he talks to them. And we're just very happy. We know that they have to make their own choice. But they know they're well loved. They, there's not a single doubt. And also they know another thing. They know their parents are not hypocrites. Their parents live what they believe. And when they were young, maybe they didn't like it. But now that they're older and they see their friends, they go, you know, we're really glad our parents are, are uh -huh. transparent. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, they, they don't, they, the kids know the difference, what you're at church and what you're at home. But if it's the same thing, they tell you they're grateful, even though they don't want to follow your path immediately. But anyway, we're, we, we trust the Lord and we turn them over and we sleep well at night and Looking forward to the day when they come and join us. Yeah. Well, my children are still pretty young. Uh, we have five of them, nine and under. And so I will say this. Um, it amazes me how our Father in Heaven is able to take a desperately wicked heart, an individual who has indulged in sin so much, develop these tremendous propensities to sin and somehow win them mm -hmm. and win them to the point that while they retain their free will, they will choose to never violate him. They will choose to never rebel. That's just mind blowing. And I think mm -hmm. that the best thing that any parent could do is seek to model that example. And Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The reason why we're drawn to Jesus is because of his character. And that's that agape love. Now, God has revealed his agape love for us. And for us, as Pastor David was saying, to reveal agape love to our children, I think, gives them the best shot to respond. The other thing is, Jesus is also the truth. And I think that we've been toying with some failed experiments in the church for quite a long time with youth by trying to bring in the ways of the world to somehow retain the youth. I think that that's been tried for over 30 years and has proven to be an utter failure. I think that what the youth need is present truth for this time, Amen. a revelation of the character of God, the true and full gospel, and to be educated right through into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary that they can be prepared to give the loud cry. Now, as a father, I have failed my children tremendously, many times. I failed my wife many times. And I think it's also very important to be willing when you fail your children, to be able to connect with them at the heart and share with them that you're sorry for how you failed them, that Jesus's way is different than that. We're directing them to Jesus, help them to see the healthy relationship side and help them to know that while we have failed, we're seeking to grow to be like Jesus, that we can model that for them for when they fail as well. Thank you. Beautiful. We have time for one more short question and especially short answers. <clears throat> Sorry. We have time for one more short Question and short answers, but this really <clears throat> needs a little more discussion. Can you discuss signs of demonic oppression and ways to deal with it? Short answers. <laughs> All right, so um, there are many signs of demonization, but if you're going to talk about possession, um, Judas had a spirit for three and a half years and the other disciples did not realize it. So a spirit can be well hidden. But if the spirit is manifesting itself, it will often manifest itself 
a variety of symptoms. You can see it in the eyes. They may look like um, a lizard or a snake. They're very cold. You'll hear it in the tone of the voice. Uh, the voice may change male or female. It will go to a register they don't normally have. You'll hear it in the language that they use, where they start cursing Jesus using foul language, a language you've never heard them using before. You'll see it in the, in the, the, the way the body um, holds itself. Um, sometimes the body will have essentially superhuman strength. Sometimes the body can crawl across the, slither across the ground like a snake. That's not humanly possible, but it is for someone who's possessed. Sometimes they'll roar like a lion or howl like a jackal. And then you'll know that there is a demon who's doing that um, through that person. Sometimes when you're speaking with somebody and you ask them a spiritual question, the demon will speak back at you. And when that demon speaks back at you, you know it. Because every sense in your body screams you're in the presence of evil. It's overwhelming. And you don't need any degree or license to know that there's a demon speaking to you through that person. So those are some obvious physiological examples that you do see in, in deliverance ministry. Um, some people have other manifestations. They will complain. Uh, many people these days, particularly those who've been watching pornography, that's the that's the, 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 the cherished sin they have. And so they will complain of physical or sexual assault on a nightly basis by spirits. Um, the sexual assault is real, male and female. Other people will complain of, of being for sensation of being strangled at night. Other people will complain of screams in the bedroom or the bed levitating. Um, there's a whole variety of symptoms that people complain of. And um, th there is no point, don't, when somebody complains about these things to you, um, you need to take it seriously. Because if, pe if somebody opens up to you about this, they know that you could just dismiss them as being crazy. And yet this is very real in their life. And so it's important to listen respectfully and to try and figure out with that person um, what is happening in their life. Is there a, is there a, a, a non-demonic explanation for what is happening for you? Or is there obviously a demonic um, explanation for what is happening? And so when people talk to you about these things, they are opening up often about the, the deepest and most shameful secrets of their lives. And you will find there are often cherished and hidden sins things that they know about and sometimes things they're unaware of. And so if there is a, a family familiar spirit or an ancestral spirit, like I think we have people here from Haiti, um, if, you, if, if you come from a society where there's voodoo, uh, your grandma may have been involved in voodoo. When your grandma dies, she made a pact with a demon that, that her bloodline is devoted to that spirit. And the demon will often skip a generation and come to the granddaughter here in America and the granddaughter has no idea why she studies slitting her wrists or has this existential pain. And the psychologist and psychiatrist can't figure out what is happening. But in deliverance ministry, you're kind of asking the questions, what is the family background? Has someone died in the family? Was something passed on from one generation to the next? And you'll often find that there is a familiar spirit within that bloodline. And uh, the, the solution to that is, is recognizing the truth that Jesus' death on Calvary was the once and for all sacrifice to redeem us from slavery to sin, which is also slavery to Satan. And so the demons may claim a, a blood sacrifice from you, but the response to that is to quote the scriptures that talk about the sacrifice of Christ. So this is a very short answer. We could talk about it all day, but there are many manifestations that we do see. And there are some people who carry demons into the church. They don't realize it. The other church members don't re realize it, but it does control their behavior in the church. We see in Mark chapter 2, a man with a spirit in the synagogue who could sit through the worship of Jehovah, and it was only when Jesus started speaking in the service that the spirit reacted to this. So it is possible to bring spirits into the church. In the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries, we know this from historical documents, when people came into the church, they were coming from a pagan background, and that involved the worship of idols, which was demon worship. And so um, people, when they joined the church, they, were joined, they joined what was known as the catechumenate. They were catechumenized. And that meant they were instructed in the way of, of, of the scriptures. And they were often baptized around the Easter festival time, that time of the year. Um, but before they were baptized, um, the early churches in the Roman Empire would often do a ritual deliverance process to rid them of the spirits before they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we do our baptisms in our churches, you, you often notice this 
we have reduced baptism to just a public demonstration of your faith in Jesus Christ, but it's a whole lot more than that. And part of baptism is receiving the Holy Spirit in a deeper and more beautiful way than ever you've experienced before. And so praying with people for the infilling of the Holy Spirit at their baptism, praying for the, the demons to be driven out of their life, praying for a manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit and gifts to be given to that individual are important components of entry into the body of Christ. And we generally don't do that these days, and we almost never do a deliverance process if somebody is coming from a background that has any occultic involvement. And if this is an average Adventist congregation, probably about 5 to 20% of the people here do have a cult in their backgrounds. They may not even realize it. And that, that occultic background may actually be controlling some aspect of our lives today. So it's a very short answer, but you did say short. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago, we were doing some missionary work in the Dominican Republic, where, where um, you know, we were we were being confronted with some some voodoo, and there were people moving in ways that human beings cannot move, and in that particular type of possession, it can be very intense. Because we're not talking about necessarily just one demon. We're talking about total possession to the place where the physiological aspects of the being are being controlled by demons. And that's one issue. Uh, we left there and we went um, into Quebec, traveled up. It was as far north as you could go in Quebec. And we did an evangelistic series in a Catholic church, preached the three angels messages there. And on opening night, there was much demon possession that was manifest there from the shamans of a, of a uh, native tribe. And initially, uh, the first person that came up, the spirit came out of them just through prayer in claiming, in quoting scripture in prayer and claiming the blood of Jesus. But another one that came later on, it wasn't until uh, six meetings that that man was delivered. And so this is not something that there's a, a formula for, but I will tell you this. There is power in the word of God. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And when Jesus enters the soul, he is stronger than any fallen demon, right? Next thing is, is that demon possession does not always look like this. We are told to guard well the avenues of the soul. There is a demon of intemperance. When we indulge in sin, we are opening up ourselves to demonic influence. Who do you think it is that's tempting you to sin? Yes, you have a desperately wicked, deceitful heart. Never forget that. However, fallen angels are tempting you. And when we allow them to come in through the avenues of the soul, guard well what you watch, guard well what you listen to, guard well how you eat, Guard well these things and don't expect to be delivered from sin in your life unless we're willing to guard those avenues. And by the way, when we're struggling with certain things that we know we need to guard well and we're finding that we're lacking strength, right? One of the things that we need to do is fortify our minds through the avenues of the soul, through reading and through listening to the word of God. And also what I do is I search Spirit of Prophecy, right on my phone, and I find everything relating to that subject that I'm struggling with in inspiration, and I read it and read it and read it. And you know what that does? That gives the opportunity of the Holy Spirit to fortify the entire mind with inspiration that has power in it that you may now be delivered because you ultimately will be the one making the choice. I've only had two experiences with demon possession. The first was at the university. I guess I need this. Uh, the first was at the university in Venezuela at our Adventist university after a week of prayer. A young man came in and said he enters a fit of rage if anybody makes fun of him and he feels like killing him, which is not, that's pretty strong reaction. Just to want to kill somebody just because they, say something that you feel is uncomfortable. So I suspected, I asked him about his past and he said he did have parents that were involved in, in spiritism. So then I led him through a prayer uh, in which he gave, he said he, he's baptized. He said he was baptized. He said he gave his heart to the Lord, but I, I, I led him through a prayer 
And when he got to the name of Jesus, he couldn't pronounce it. And, and then suddenly there was a roar of anger and he kicked, the, I was in a pastor's office and he kicked a pastor's desk across the room and went flying against the wall. And, and then I said, oh my, this is my first experience. But I, 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 was, I was in good, uh, I had everything clear with the Lord. I had nothing between me and the Lord. So I immediately, I immediately ordered the demon to leave. He started talking. I ordered him to shut his mouth in the name of Jesus. And I, and I ordered him to leave. But, it, but I found out there was three times that they had, he had a terrible struggle and evidently the demon left. And then he had another terrible struggle and this one tried to choke him. He couldn't breathe. So I, I had to order that in the name of Jesus, the demon allow, take his hands off of his throat and allow him to breathe. And he started breathing. It, it took three times before he finally was at rest. And then he said, he's never been so free in his life. I wrote his name in, in, uh, in the, the, the book I had, I was with me at that time was Christian service. I wrote the date, his name, and he's still, as far as I knew for many years, I had contact with him. He was free like he'd never been before. God took out those. The other time was in India, and India is such a traumatic country for me because demon possession is everywhere, and on the streets, on the road, and, and I was invited. I was invited by an evangelist. I was in Australia at the time, and I was invited to come to India, and it was a little hop and a skip down there. I, I, up there, I went up, and, and it was an evangelical pastor that had 250 pastors in his denomination, and he wanted me to speak to his pastors. So I went there, and, and, um, and I did. It was a wonderful time together. We addressed all of the main issues, and all 250 pastors, they, were, they took it in. We studied the Bible. We went over the major doctrines. Uh, but I was still surprised that it would take an evangelical to invite me. I was union department, departmental for ADRA and communication in Venezuela at the time. And, and so I said, is there... Is there, an Adventist, is there an Adventist church around here? Oh, just down the block. So I asked the pastor to, to come, and, and he wasn't quite sure about this Adventist pastor, department director, who was coming to speak in evangelical churches. He said, why didn't you come to our church? I said, you never invited me. <laughs> I said, I came to wherever they invited me. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that God is opening doors among evangelicals. Sure. Like never before. I have pastors call me. They wanted, they accepted the Sabbath. How do I get it across to my congregation? I know I'm going to get fired someday talking, talking by my denomination, which keeps Sunday, but I believe in a seventh day Sabbath. So I said, establish the principles uh, of Protestantism. Teach them the principles of Protestantism. Your denomination is a Protestant denomination. Sola Scriptura. Everything you believe, prove it from the Bible. And then when they've all accepted the Bible as their firm foundation, then say, what does the Bible say about the day of worship? But by that time, they're all firmly established. And let them decide, let the Holy Spirit decide. And, but in India, I had that problem. And, and uh, again, the lady, the lady uh, was relieved from a demon possession to the name of Jesus. But there are so many of them, they're everywhere, on every street corner, that I'm overwhelmed by how Satan has hurt that country. Such beautiful people. But may God always keep us, you know, if you're not right with God and you have hidden sin, you better not get involved in and asking a demon to leave somebody because he's going to expose everything hidden sin in your life. But if everything is right and forgiven, you have authority in Jesus name. Okay. And Pastor Vine already described all the different types of things, but, but just stay close to the Lord and you can speak with authority in Jesus name. Good. So it's past time. It's past time. And so, uh, John, would you like to have a closer prayer? I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we depart this meeting and prepare for the next, I pray, Lord, that these things that we have discussed today will linger a bit in our minds and that we may prove out and search these things, Lord, and prepare as we set our hearts firmly 
in conviction, with great conviction, to no matter what happens, to, to leave our eyes focused on Christ. I pray, Lord, with whatever situation we find ourselves in, that we do a work, and that work, whatever it might be, that we do it with all our might. Father, we know that sometimes there are struggles that take place. We've seen many of them with different things we've been involved with. And as we work together with a goal of seeing souls won for your kingdom, a lot of these issues are laid aside. I pray, Father, here today that each one of us may learn how to work closely together and work firmly with our resolve to press on to the new Jerusalem. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Six thirty is the next one. Yeah. Yeah.